that you saw them over there uh, on the ground, you should use such a no-till machine, which is just putting down any remaining residues mm -hmm. uh, or, or from the cover crop, and then using a uh, disc opener to open the seed swap, double disc in this case, place the seed, and then cover. We believe actually that uh, regenerative, and we call it uh, mainly conservation agriculture, <coughs> is the way forward to uh, uh, is a response to agri-environmental the sustainability challenges challenges worldwide. You see, this is uh, this is ECAF, uh, which is composed today of uh, of 19 national associations, uh, starting here from the very southwest of uh, of Europe uh, to the very northeast of Europe in Finland. But even uh, we have a Russian movement on conservation agriculture. And we were founded, as already mentioned, in 99. And uh, our activity is mainly focused on soil health, development of biodiversity, and uh, climate action. And for this, our main activities are uh, networking, advocacy, dissemination, demonstration, training, and uh, project participation. We uh, uh, participated already in uh, quite a few, uh, both European uh, projects and also life projects and uh, ECAF uh, run a life project that won actually an award, a European award as best, uh, one of the best life projects. You see uh, the principles of regenerative <coughs> agriculture are uh, provided here. This is a picture that was uh, developed and is exposed at the Groundswell, Groundswell website. Groundswell is uh, today the, I would say, the biggest event in Europe about regenerative agriculture. It started off uh, six years ago uh, as a no-till show and it uh, moved on uh, and is today called the, uh, well, the Regenerative Agriculture Festival. And okay, why it's uh, something that uh, it's under development and you see here the five principles uh, of regenerative agriculture as understood by Groundswell. And you can see here, you have uh, the five principles are uh, minimized soil disturbance. Uh, it's to protect the soil surface, to uh, improve uh, the diversity on the ground, uh, maintain living roots, and finally livestock integration. Well, on the uh, leaflet and the brochure you received, it's, uh, these five principles are, are written. And, but it restricts also this uh, livestock integration where feasible and uh, the same is uh, maintain living roots because if you have a prolonged dry season as under rain-fed agriculture in southern Europe, for example, you can't maintain living roots. But the key principles actually of conservation agriculture must be, as we understand it, uh, it's first of all minim uh, minimization of soil disturbance you should, uh, if possible, uh, use no-till practice. And, uh, and then the other key principle is pr protect soil uh, surface because in order to keep the soil permanently covered all year, year round, whether through living plants, whether through crop residues. But the soil needs protection. And the third key principle, in our view, is the diversity and diversity achieved through uh, crop rotations, through cover crops, through uh, uh, well, especially large crop rotations are uh, are key, and also to cover the soil with uh, living plants uh, in between uh, cropping seasons. So the key principles of regenerative agriculture are mainly these, and if possible, you add you can add additional principles that can help uh, to improve uh, your soil health. You see here, uh, and in this way, conservation agriculture and th these three principles uh, contribute to preserve, restore, and enhance ecosystems and biodiversity. Because regarding of, uh, with regard to the soil, and Philip mentioned it already, reduction of erosion, increased soil organic matter, improved uh, improvement of natural fertility and overall soil health, with regard to water, we improve infiltration, reduce runoff we, through the permanent soil cover. You uh, reduce uh, losses of water, less evaporation, 
and uh, this means improved water use efficiency. You also reduce, through reduced runoff, you reduce the off-site transport uh, of agrochemicals to other uh, ecosystems uh, uh, and this improves water quality and quantity. With regard to the atmosphere, we, uh, we have less greenhouse gas emissions, especially uh, CO2, which comes mainly from fuel, but even more from the mineralization of solar organic carbon. And if you, uh, if you uh, disturb the soil less, then less uh, solar organic matter is mineralized. And we also can reduce uh, green, uh, nitrous oxide emission and uh, methane through uh, the reduction of uh, fertilizers. And finally, we can put and increase carbon in the soil, which means carbon sequestration and, uh, well, to take out uh, atmospheric CO2. And finally, biodiversity is also key because the less you disturb the soil, the more uh, you create a positive habitat for uh, uh, soil living organisms, increase fauna, earthworm populations, and also even above ground uh, popu uh, bird population is much increased. And we have a, a nice report on, on these uh, benefits. So overall improved ecosystems, water quality and flora diversity. But it's not only uh, the, these aspects, the environmental aspects, it's the economic and social aspects. And uh, these principles of conservation agriculture also help to, uh, to a better economic performance by reducing operational costs, fuels are saved, uh, external inputs are less, labor saving, timeliness of operations. If you don't have a plowed field, you can uh, go on the field almost whenever you want and perform your operations on time. And we can uh, such, uh, thus achieve high and stable yields. And uh, with regard to social uh, aspects, we also support uh, generational change and women inclusion, maintain rural areas dynamic, and especially we can save time on the tractor. We have more time for leisure. And uh, there's also a direct uh, link between soil health and food health. So uh, safeguard food quality and health. Uh, all over uh, the planet, we do have uh, different, uh, well, adoptions of conservation agriculture. You can see here, uh, it's mainly adopted in the Americas, North America, and especially South America, where almost 70% of the cropland is under CA. Uh, other, uh, and uh, Australia and Oceania is also uh, quite uh, high, the adoption, whereas other regions, uh, both uh, Asia, but especially Africa, and also Europe lag behind the adoption of CA. And this is our goal to improve this situation, especially in Europe. And what we see today in the field are cover crops. Cover crops are key to sustainable agriculture, to uh, regenerative agriculture, and to uh, conservation agriculture. And cover crops, you may know what it is. It's a, uh, a non-cash crop grown between or within primary cash crops and they are normally grown uh, outside the main cropping seasons. So this is uh, what we are going to see uh, later in the field. And uh, the cover crop benefits are actually tremendous. You can see here all these uh, positive aspects, direct aspects, as more carbon input to the system, nutrient retention, catch crop, serve as a catch crop, as already mentioned, uh, fix uh, atmospheric nitrogen, protect the soil in the off-growing season, uh, they regulate soil moisture, they help suppress weed, pest and, uh, and diseases, and also improve soil structure. And then you have all these further indirect benefits of cover crops. So cover crops is actually a core element of uh, sustainable agriculture and of course as well regenerative agriculture. And with this I finish and pass over to Yalte from SEMA. Yeah, well, <laughs> okay. I think I can. One key message for today is um, filling up the farmer's toolbox because what do farmers need to produce and prosper and make farming more sustainable? Well, that's the main question for our industry as, as agricultural machinery 
manufacturers. Uh, we ask that question to ourselves every day, and the answer is quite straightforward. Fill up the toolbox for the farmers so they can choose from an ever broader and sophisticated range of technologies. Because it's the farmers that need to have the ability to say, okay, this fits my farm, this fits my crop, this is how my practice works, this is the climate I work in, uh, so I need this machine and that machine. And uh, I had a preliminary talk with uh, Philip van Avermaet, and he said, we are very happy because 20 years ago you had for one kind of type of soil working one machine, and now we have five on the farm, so we can be more precise. So literally the toolbox is being filled up by, by our industry, and to let farmers uh, choose uh, from a more wider range and enable them to make it happen, to make more sustainable farming happening while maintaining, of course, food security, which is a very, very big topic and sometimes overlooked in all the discussions about sustainability. Um, Emphasis should lie uh, that for how dynamic farming is. Um, so one size does not fit all. We have that fight sometimes in Brussels as the representative of the agricultural machinery industry that, that uh, legislation for the whole of Europe is being made there. But we say be careful with that because farming is too diverse. Farming in the Alps is very different than fam farming here, farming in the south of Italy or in Portugal, or it's everywhere very, very different. So uh, be careful with generic regulations uh, for all the farmers in, uh, in Europe. Because um, it's farmers mainly who, who rely and trust uh, uh, on, on our technologies and, and they know how to operate them. It's very difficult with legislation to push farmers into a certain direction, we would say. And um, we would also emphasize Keep the tools in, that are in the toolbox, that are now there, keep them as much in the toolbox uh, um, uh, as we can. Because taking away tools from the toolbox, and there is a tendency here and there to do that, um, makes it actually difficult. As Philip uh, uh, van Avermaet said, it's learning. So even a farm this advanced, this size, with, with, with uh, a, a young, uh, forward-looking farming couple are very frank about it, they're learning. So if you take tools from their toolbox they are used to use to underpin financially their farm to make production and to be able to sell, if you take that away, um, it might be very difficult actually for many farmers to succeed and make transitions to uh, a type of farming like we see here today, which is only one way of doing it. I mean, there are many more ways. Uh, I would like to emphasize that what fits farmers, what fits the region where farmers are from and what the crop is. is, uh, is. Um, um, we would uh, like to very much uh, um, or we would like to invite you, of course, to our station. There are three stations today, and you will all have a look at all the stations. And we hope we can enlighten you a bit more by showing off the technology, and the Harsh uh, company will do that for sure, uh, by, by what, what we are working on, uh, our manufacturers are working on, and how we can improve uh, uh, the, um, uh, the toolbox for the farmers, and therefore sustainability in agriculture. Um, and um, um, I'm looking actually forward to go outside because it's beautiful weather. I don't know about you, but uh, let's go into action, I would say. But uh, I would give over to Mark, who is the ceremony uh, leader. Thank you. Thank you, Jelke. We just have... Good. Very short. So I'm Hinze Boonstra. I'm Public Affairs Manager for Bayer in Brussels, and I focus on biodiversity and climate policy. So regenerative agriculture is very much what is in what I'm focusing on. Um, we will talk, I will give you some starting points for sustainability in agriculture. Very short, those points that we are working on as Bayer and that we believe is very important when you talk about sustainable agriculture and you want to actually advance it. Firstly, on Bayer Crop Science, for those that don't know us, Bayer Crop Science is part of a Bayer, a German company, also produces medican, medication for humans and consumer health products, lotions and that sort of stuff. I'm working for the crop science division um, and we are producing seeds, pesticides, both the biological ones as well as the chemical ones, digital tools and integrated solutions. So we also combine tools and practices, not only ours, but also of course 
others that are in the market. So when we talk about points, starting points for uh, sustainability, then this is number one, sustainability itself. And I guess everybody knows it, but we always mention it because sustainability is delivering on social, environmental and economic sustainability objectives. It's important uh, that we take these three objectives into account and that it's a combination thereof. There are always trade-offs and synergies between these objectives. Eh? So you can never accomplish them all at the same farm, for instance. But it doesn't matter, as long as the combination of farms delivers on what it is that we need, right? The second point which is very important is diversity in sustainable agriculture. There are many different farming systems around. Today we talk regenerative, conservation, carbon farming in this uh, type. But of course there's a lot around as well. And over here you see a few words, a few terms that are used in the European debate, but they're all good. They all contribute to sustainability, they all have their weaknesses and challenges, and they all can improve. And the way they can do that is to have access to tools and practices. And Yelta already mentioned it, but that is really important. If you want to increase on your sustainability, you need to have the tools and the practices to do so. And there are many. We have, of course, the minimal tillage, the cover crops, the typical regenerative conservation type practices, but you also have your machinery, which was already mentioned, and nutrients, water, of course, land, all, the, all what you need as a farmer. What we think is very important if we want to use uh, the diversity in farming, being inclusive to different farming systems, if we want to have access to the tools and practices as farmers, that we move to an outcome-based thinking. If we de uh, define what it is that we want as society, the sustainability outcomes, then farmers can design the farm systems with the tools and practices they have at hand that deliver on these outcomes. We think that is really powerful uh, because it is inclusive towards farmers, towards systems and the tools and practices they need. Of course, you need to measure outcomes. And I think that is one of the challenges that we face today. Eh? We see that in some areas, like for instance, in carbon farming, we're moving to a situation where we want to reward something which is extra. You need to be able to measure it accurately and cost effectively, otherwise it will not work. And that is a challenge and we will go into it uh, during the farm tour as well. And obviously, last but not least, you need to reward it. And that's a challenge in itself as well. And it's not necessarily that society is willing to pay the bill if we want to have certain objectives realized. So this is also a very important one. And there are very different opportunities. Eh? You can subsidize, but you can go also into the market place all the way up to the consumer. So these are the, the key considerations that we always take into account when we are discussing sustainable agriculture and working on it. So that was my contribution. And now we go into the field. So questions you can ask at the stations and of course afterwards, because we have a barbecue and then we are all there. So. Regenerative agriculture means that 
we have a lot of different conditions in which we have to use a certain type or sort of machine and uh, we see that nowadays manufacturers are yeah, widening their uh, range of products and that's good for us as a farmer um, also yeah I don't know what do we use we we use actually a lot of GPS on our tractors um, but also on our like the spreader it's the fertilizer spreader um, yeah that one so it's GPS driven um, it's section controlled so it's oh, it only spreads where it's needed and it doesn't give like the double uh, if it's back in time machines were just on or off and nowadays these machines are really changing and they are just giving what's needed and where needed um, and that's really good for the farmers to economize firstly but also yeah you don't need everything everywhere the same amount of quantities of anything mm. on the crops um, but yeah we as I said back in um, the local we use a lot of manure solid manure we try to use on this farm only the solid manure because it gives a lot of um, carbon to the soil also um, and that's all all is spread with this spreader um, this spreader is also equipped with uh, the function of um, using task maps so also uh, controlled um, where we want to spread anything also like calcium is very important to yeah normally we spread it anywhere but if we can use um, map soil maps like for example or um, um, harvesting on the harvesters we have mapping of the yields that also helps us to see bad spots in a field and good spots and then we can decide whether we will put more or less um, fertilizer or um, anything we want um, but yeah I don't know the machinery as you see is maybe is big this is a mechanical weeder it's a tine weeder um, we use it a lot from yeah like three years ago we bought this machine because yeah I think it's another way to see agriculture and I think mechanical weeders actually is the only thing where um, the her, um, pests the the wheat the wheat can't be resistant of me mechanical thing is always it works or it doesn't work but the wheat won't get resistant no. to mechanical no. to <laughs> something mechanical <laughs> and that's really nice and that's why we bought this machine to use uh, when it's needed also if there are bad weather conditions and the the, 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 the plants are germinated but can't come up because mm. there is a crust then we use these machines to break the crust and, and still have a good yield probably um, but as you can see there we have like the the purple nozzles underneath the machine that's something we did it ourselves because that's what we use for uh, like um, the the insecticide in little stadium of the crop we drive with this machine we do a mechanical weeding and we use the insecticides but only on the plant and that's how we can reduce also mm. the amount of insecticides for example but also fung fungicides uh, that we need um, then we have the sprayer of course yeah, we are also busy in the field, so it's...
quite busy today, as always. But uh, yeah, this trail we see a big difference because it's um, also the the like the boom control, the technology of the machines is developing. As I said at the other group, the tine weeder ten years ago there was a tine weeder, but now you see. A lot of companies, manufacturers have the time readers, but they're and they're getting more sophisticated and you can use them more often in different um, um, ways or, or time situations. Um, and then this prayer also, so it's due to the, yeah, I don't know, the, the, the technology this prayer, the, he lowers the boom itself, so we have less um, drift by wind, for example. The droplets can be formed behind the, the shade, so it's the, all the droplets that are formed are precise, are perfect. If there are, is not the, the, the thing before, you have wind constantly coming into the nozzle and that doesn't work good. So we see a big development by this sprayer. We have it from this year. Um, we can speed up the, the treatment so we can drive 20 or 30 kilometers an hour in the fields sometimes. And that's really, really, for our farm, it's really important that we can do it and use it that way. Um, for the rest, I think I will because leave labor to the is an issue, no? Mm. Because labor is, of course, an and issue. You need yeah. bigger machines, actually, yeah, that's it. that go fast. Yeah. Mm. And if bad weather comes, you also need to go out and mm. quickly do yeah. your job. That's but it. labor is an issue. Huh? Yeah, here in Belgium, probably labor is an issue. The cost, the hourly cost, is really high of the people on it. Um, but we know that we need those people also if we want to use maybe less um, chemicals we need to use more like the mechanical weeding then we need more people to drive with it because it's consuming more time mm. for us also but we invest in those people we have one guy who is always on this machine in spring so he knows the machine i don't have to be with it he just drives with it everywhere where needed and he knows how to adjust the machine and you see that the people here working here are also also thinking with us to develop the farm or to help and get the farm better in better things yeah satellites. I went to the University of uh, Ghent, sorry Tessa, <laughs> I went first to Ghent, uh, because that's the University of Leuven, uh, um, and the professor there he told me, Mark, you should first look into the ground. Now we came into contact with the company uh, Agromatius, uh, and Agromatius they have uh, a soil scanner. So on a soil scanner, what does this uh, machine do? In fact, it's sending electricity through the soil, and this is this machine that they drive over the field, and you see these discs, uh, electricity is sent through the disc, and is captured by the other disc. And so we can measure the electroconductivity from the soil. And the electric conductivity is a proxy for yield potential. So there's a lot of stuff that comes uh, into that. Uh, it has to do with the uh, soil's texture, but it has also to do with the uh, soil composition, with the minerals in the soil, but at the end you can say that electric conductivity is a proxy for yield potential. So we did this, uh, but this machine can do more than only that. You see that it's also equipped 
with a sensor who is measuring the soil pH. Soil pH is very important uh, um, as, as, as uh, a given for the productivity also. You need to keep it somewhere between 6 and 7. Uh, not going to explain all the details, depending on which crop, depending on which type of uh, soil. Um, and there is also a possibility to measure organic material in the soil. It's with an infrared sensor that this is used so we can measure how much organic material is in the field. And why is this now important to do this with such a machine? Because also before we were already sampling soils. So people, farms were going into the field, taking samples on different spots in the field, mixing everything together, send it to the lab and you get the result back. And your pH is 6.4, your organic material is 1 point so much and uh, um, uh, the conductivity was not measured, uh, so this is now new into this. And what can you do with that? This is another farm where we're also working. This is the field uh, in front of the farm. So normally when we get back the results, the monitoring from the field, it's one result at this pH of 6.4. Now with this machine, we are not going to measure an average, but we are going to measure in squares of 10 by 10 meters. This is GPS steer, so we know exactly this sample is coming from this spot in the field. And then you see that if you look at the same field and you look at the pH, that the pH is varying from 5.8 to 7.2. So in some spots it's too low, in other spots of the field it's too high. And then the question is of course, what can we now do with that? Uh, well, we can use this uh, to put again in the fertilizer spread that you're going to see later on uh, in the field uh, and make this task map. So we are going to put only lime in this case on the spots where the pH is too low. And we are not going to apply lime where the pH is already uh, very high. So this allows, in fact, to optimize the inputs uh, on, on the field. That's a very important element um, that we um, are working together with companies delivering this service uh, in order then to give agronomic advice later on. Also, and uh, Thales, my colleague, will uh, later on explain you what we are doing in carbon farming. This could be also something important when we're going to follow up fields on the development of carbon uh, content, carbon content. Uh, sequestration uh, although it's not that simple because it's quite expensive to do this it costs more than you will get for your carbon credits or your carbon compensation uh, so we need to find other ways to do this so that's one element I wanted to explain to you and the second element is uh, this is a very technical way to measure but you have also the eyes and the experience, and Philip was uh, earlier explaining, you feel closer to the soil. If you're doing this kind of work, uh, you stay closer to the soil, you know what's happening. And we took um, from two fields, in fact it's one field, um, half of this field is ploughed, I've continued to plough since the 80s, the other one is stop plough, already for 20 years. And we have two uh, samples that we took from the soil and you will see this one it's uh, a little bit uh, less dark than this one it contains less organic material uh, so it's taken at the same depth in the field uh, because if you take it at the surface you will even have bigger differences because a lot of the organic material stays at the surface uh. now a very easy way but also uh, a little bit tricky because I'm not sure that it works every time. Uh, <laughs> make it work three times today. Uh, if you put this in water, you will see what um, Flip was explaining. Uh, so your soil, because there is more organic material, uh, so your soil uh, clay humus complex, it's stronger. Uh, and you see that this field is dissolving much faster uh, than where you have more carbon into the soil, so the low tillage, not plowing. And this is the advantage, one of the big uh, benefits and uh, what we call, uh, in fact, co-benefits of uh, carbon farming, is that you also are going to uh, protect against erosion. So the mistake that's often uh, made is that people just look at one Thing when they talk about regenerative agriculture, carbon farming and so on, you should look at the whole system. Flip already nicely explained 
the water retention, for example, the water retention in this soil is uh, bigger than in this soil. So you have a lot of these co-benefits and you see nicely how this works. So uh, no chemical treatments. <laughs> uh, so I didn't uh, prepare this especially, but it's always a little bit uh, yeah, waiting to see if it works quite well. So that's um, another example and I can show you this also on a picture. Because you, you need also to measure, of course. Uh, and uh, first of all, I will show you the picture of how these fields look. So this is the part of the field which is ploughed. This is the part of the field. In this case, it's it's no no till. It's minimum till. So it's not really uh, turning around the soil, but leaving the soil in place, but still lifting it. Flip is working in the next step already not trying to have this deep surface uh, uh, yeah, disturbance anymore of the soil. And later on, Gottlieb explained to you already before, he will also cover this. But what's really important that if you look to the uh, pictures below, see in this field, uh, this is in the middle of the summer, you can see the erosion uh, gaps which are there, uh, while in the other part of the field, there you can see no erosion that uh, happened. We also measure this, and why is this important, of course, to avoid erosion, to keep your uh, good soil on the field, but also to avoid that you get runoff of fertilizers and crop protection products into the surface water. And because a field which is eroding, the water is disappearing from your field, it's going somewhere. Uh, it's ending up into surface water. So also, this is something which is a co-benefit of having this uh, technology. Well, we started eight years ago, we started uh, with non-plowing and like three years ago we started to use less uh, chemicals in general and use like the mechanical weeding also introduced, yeah, we, we introduced that in our farm. Just uh, a lot of mo a lot more insects, a lot more biodiversity in our fields. We have less erosion. Yeah, actually, almost everything is getting better with our fields on our fields. So less erosion, more nutrients available. So we have to uh, have uh, a little I mean, less input of chemicals. And it's, yeah, I think it's really nice, yeah. I think 90%. <laughs> yeah, no one believes what we are doing here. So it's difficult to talk with other farmers. But from this year, we see that other farmers are starting to get the idea and beginning to, yeah. Mod yeah, change their uh, habits. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just more cost efficient. So we, yeah, it's it's for us it costs less to use to do precision agriculture. Um, we can, yeah, low put some nutrients more local or like on band it works really good because we can just spray there where the leaves are and not in between and that's something that works and it's not difficult to adopt uh, or change but it's really cost efficient yeah so <laughs> I, for me, it's just stop plowing. I think the plow, it's something so unnatural 
and the soil, living soil, is just natural. So if you stop plowing, it will be the beginning of a natural soil. The, everything will begin to live in the soil and that's really, really important to be, to go into the regenerative way of agriculture because I don't say that I'm regenerative because I do some things but I can't do anything or at least not now I I will develop it or I learn every year and I try to do some different things every year so yeah 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 and you can't do everything on one year it's just step by step we see that we can grow into things actually in spring when the gr crops are growing it's really day by day we see what has to happen to the crops of what we have to do to the crops to let them grow like it has to be so it's like you say but at the other side um, legislations are always built on dates and we see that by doing the more regenerative for what we do we are more uh, we are it's easier for us to follow the dates or to do everything between some dates that are set by government and a classic farmer maybe it's sometimes it's more difficult and they want to um, put the date later or anything and we see that we don't have those difficulties anymore less chemicals I think and then yeah and also less soil disturbance yeah I, I yeah yeah it's just an healthy soil natural living soil that's the three words natural living soil <laughs>